Hello guys, it's me Simo Ora Hara and in this video we will talk about Ichigo's goal and why he doesn't have a unique slash big goal. And to put you guys in the context of this video, when I say a big or unique goal, I mean the well known goals of shonen heroes like I want to be the king of the world or I want to get the black crystal or any goal that becomes the central point of the story. Because some people criticize Ichigo by saying Ichigo is a character without a goal. That's why in this video guys, I want to discuss this topic from my point of view. So first, since we're not having a big or unique goal been a bad thing for a protagonist. I'm not talking about Ichigo yet, but I want to discuss this idea itself. Since when has having a big goal been the standard by which we judge if a character is a good or bad? This criteria isn't a measure to say a character is a good because they have a big goal or bad because they don't have a big one. It's possible for a character to have a big unique goal but the way they achieve it or how their character is developed may not be good and thus the goal becomes a weakness. In the opposite, a character without a unique or big goal can still be well built and integrated into the story, making them special without needing that big goal. Of course, having a big goal or a unique one has its positives, I'm not denying that aspect like keeping the story cohesive and making the audience interested in whether the hero will achieve that goal or not and how he will achieve it etc. But as I said, that's not the only criteria for judging if a character is a good or bad. And now guys, let's answer the video's question. Why doesn't Ichigo have a big slash unique goal? For example, Naruto's goal was to become a Hokage. And Luffy's goal is to become the king of pirates and find the one piece. So why doesn't Ichigo have such goals? The first answer we can start with is related to the nature of each story world. Because as you know guys, the world and the environment of the hero shape their future goals. If for instance Naruto grew up in a village and related to the ninja world and the hidden leaf village, he wouldn't think about becoming a ninja or a hokage in the first place. And the same goes for Luffy. If there were no pirate era, he wouldn't think of becoming a pirate. So the environment of these characters made them have those goals. Goals doesn't just fall from the sky. They grow from the hero surroundings. I know that these things may seem clear to some of you and easy to understand. But the problem is that a lot of people start reading a work expecting to find the same things they have read in their favorite manga. And this is wrong to begin with. I mean if you want to talk about Ichigo, I would like to start from one of Kubo's answers when he was asked about the theme of Bleach. Kubo said that he doesn't like to impose a specific theme on readers and prefers to let the characters develop and create their own story. And this might explain why Bleach doesn't have a single dominant theme. Moreover, Ichigo's life was entirely different from other heroes. For example, Ichigo lived a normal human life for 9 years, like any real child. Even though his mother was a Quincy and his father a Shinigami, they wanted him to live a human life. So Ichigo lived with his parents, went to dojo, went to school, and had a normal childhood. Of course, there are other things will shape Ichigo, like his spiritual power that allowed him to see souls from a young age, or his multiple inner powers, or destiny itself guiding him to a significant event. But now we're talking about Ichigo, from his perspective, a person unaware of these things, living a normal human life, thus Ichigo doesn't have a goals like other heroes. But as we said at the beginning of this video, this doesn't prevent Kubo from making Ichigo a unique character without a big shonen goal. Instead, Ichigo's main focus is on the theme of protection, a theme developed on multiple levels. And I don't know if it's fate or coincidence, but since the beginning, since he was born, Ichigo has been connected to protection. Even his name, Ichigo, consists of two kanji, one meaning one and the other meaning protect. His father, Ishan, told Ichigo that his name means the one who protects. And this is something Ichigo believed in since he was young. So if you want to talk about the first level, we should start from the first thing Ichigo wanted to protect, which is his mother. Masaki Kurosaki had a huge impact on Ichigo since childhood. 
His relationship with his mother was strong, as Ichigo described she was the center of their world, and everything revolved around her. His love for her made him want to protect her and his sisters, Yuzo and Karin. And to achieve this, he joined the dojo and learned basic fighting skills. At the time, Ichigo thought he was just a normal boy, so he took normal ways to achieve his dream of protection, and this can be considered the first level of protection that Ichigo developed, his desire to protect those close to him. But the second level is what would start Ichigo on his long journey of discovering his identity and developing his goal. And here I'm talking about his ability to see ghosts or souls. So since he was young, Ichigo had enough spiritual power to see souls clearly, making it hard for him to distinguish between the dead and the living. And this ability will be the main reason why young Ichigo falls into the Grand Fisher's trap. And this event will have a significant impact on both Ichigo's character and his life path because it touches the core of his goal, the thing he aimed for most, and unfortunately, he failed to achieve. Yes, the most important thing Ichigo wanted to protect was his mother. She was his top priority, but Ichigo failed to protect her. Instead, it was the opposite. Masaki protected him, and this left a deep wound in Ichigo an impact that stayed with him throughout his life, especially in situations where he felt unable to protect others. And Ichigo would understand this as he grew up. He would understand that his intense desire to protect wasn't enough. He needed power. Power was the only way to achieve what he wanted, the power he didn't have when his mother was in danger. And this hard truth is depicted in a side chapter set before the main story, before meeting Rokia. Although Ichigo said he would rather not see ghosts or souls, he never hesitated to help souls a lend hand. But at the same time, he felt powerless, especially when he saw those souls disappear without understanding why, leaving only blood behind. The blood that Ichigo was sensing from it, the feeling of fear. And it's clear that these souls were killed by hollows, though Ichigo didn't know this yet, as he hadn't faced a hollow before. And this brings us guys to the third level, where Ichigo learns about the existence of hollows. His desire shifts from protecting his loved ones through ordinary means to protecting them from the danger of the other world by gaining Shinigami powers. At this point, we need to focus on something about Ichigo's character, specifically regarding the first time he gained Shinigami powers. Ichigo wanted Shinigami powers to protect his family, so he didn't care about the source of that power or the consequences. He wasn't concerned about the costs of taking that power and becoming a substitute Shinigami. Ichigo was clear with Rokia. He wouldn't follow the rules of her world, but would follow his own will. He would protect others in his own way, not as the sort of society wanted. And this becomes evident in several future parts of the story. However, the issue of Ichigo's failure to protect his mother was still with him. The ghost of his inability to protect her haunted him, especially when remembering her death. But this time, he wouldn't be facing a memory. He would face her killer, the Grand Fisher. Knowing that Ichigo had been trying to protect a girl who wasn't a real and that it was all a trap set by the Grand Fisher made Ichigo want to avenge his mother. His desire to gain power to fight Hollows increased, aiming to make up for his previous inability to protect her. Yet Ichigo would fail again, and this time with Rokia. Rokia could be considered the second most influential person in Ichigo's life after his mother, Masaki Kurosaki. She was the reason he first gained his Shinigami powers. She gave him all her Shinigami powers to fight for his family and taught him the basics of everything she knew about using her power to fight Hollows. But when Rokia was in danger, when Byakuya and Rinji came to trick her to the Soul Society, Ichigo found himself unable to protect someone close to him again. Ichigo was on the ground again, 
unable to move while Rokia was taken to the Soul Society. It was one of the most difficult moments for Ichigo's life. He couldn't save Rokia. Instead, she saved him from Byakia. And this situation reopened that old wound and reminded him of what happened with his mother six years ago. Thus, it becomes clear that the issue of protection for Ichigo is not something vague but is complex and intertwined with his past, present and even future. For Ichigo, protection is a major theme, but it involves many fluctuations and changes as events unfold and as he learns new things. And here we will talk about another level of protection, which I can call conflicting protection. By this, I mean the appearance of the old man or the fake Zangitsu, who represents Ichigo's Quincy power. The old man also had a strong will to protect, but this protection was focused only on Ichigo and no one else. And I really liked how some people linked the old man's desire to protect Ichigo to Masaki's desire to protect her son. The old man's Quincy power comes from Masaki, and the last thing Masaki did in her life was to protect Ichigo. And this idea fits well with our discussion about protection. And regardless of the origin of the old man's desire to protect Ichigo, he already explained his reasons. The old man didn't want Ichigo to follow the path of the Shinigami, as it would lead him to endless conflicts with both the Holos and in the future the Quincy's, especially Yuabach. And one of the things that highlights this philosophical difference between the old man and Ichigo is what Tensa Zangitsu told Ichigo, what you want to protect is not what I want to protect. And this sentence or idea illustrated the conflict Ichigo had been living with from the beginning, without knowing it. Ichigo gained Shinigami power to protect his family, and he awakened his own Shinigami power to save Rokia and try to control his hollow power to save Orihime. Meanwhile, the old man had a different view of protection. He believed in protecting Ichigo himself, not what Ichigo wanted to protect. That's why he had been suppressing Ichigo's power for a long time. So this internal conflict within Ichigo is important to understand. And this brings us guys to another level of protection. When Ichigo went to the Soul Society to save Rokia. Personally, I consider Ichigo's journey to save Rokia one of the most significant developments and events in the story. It shifted the story from a human world to a completely different one and also changed Ichigo from a human who lived for 15 years to his second home, to his roots, through his father Ishinshiba. So all the events and battles that occurred in the Soul Society arc were all under the major theme of saving Rokia from execution, and whether Ichigo would succeed in this goal or not. And because of Ichigo's desire to protect Rokia and save her, he broke all the Shinigami laws that had been in place for a million years. Therefore, when I see some people say that Ichigo is always with the Shinigami side, I see that point of view is not objective. Ichigo is not obligated to be neutral. He wants to protect his friends and can't be bound by any specific rule. Ichigo entered the Sirichi uh, as a Ryoka and fought all the Shinigamis for someone he believed deserved to be saved. He went to save Orihime even though Yamamoto ordered him not to go to the Wiko Mondo, and protected Nail and even Grimijo. In the Quincy arc or Thousand Year Blood War arc, Ichigo went to Wiko Mondo and saved Dondon Chaka, even though he was a hollow. Therefore, Ichigo is not obligated to be loyal to any side. And this brings us to another level of protection related to power. Since he was young, Ichigo learned that just saying I want to protect others isn't enough to achieve that goal. He needed to gain strength to defend those who he wanted to protect. So Ichigo found that the Shinigami path was a way to achieve this goal by gaining more power. And despite all the obstacles the old man set to stop him from this path and the hollow desires to control him, the Arankara arc was that stage for this conflict, whether through Ichigo's fights with Hollows or his fight against Grimijo, which showed Ichigo's desire not just to protect but also to gain strength and defeat his opponents. Because we all know that Ichigo's initial intention to go to Wikomondo was to save Orihime, which he achieved when he met Orihime after she was with Grimijo. 
and Grimijo asked Ichiro why he was fighting him since his main concern was saving Orihime. Orihime was with him, so why didn't she just take her and leave? If Ichiro really wanted only to save Orihime and no one else, he would have done that. But as I mentioned, Ichiro's concept of protection was evolving with each event and, and as the story expanded. So his desire to become stronger, it was no longer just about protecting his mother or sisters or fighting a few hollows to protect uh, nearby spirits or just saving Rokia. The situation grew larger with this revelation of Aizen Sosuke and his truth and what he wanted and the existence of his father. Thus, the instinct of Ichigo Shinigami's power and soul made him want to engage in bigger battles to become stronger and ultimately achieve his main goal of protection. Ichigo's fight against Olikura was a clear example of this. When Ichigo was in a very dangerous situation, the old man stopped suppressing Ichigo's power at that moment, allowing his combined Shinigami and Holo's power to emerge again so he could fight Ilikura. And the first thing Ichigo said in his unconscious state was, I will protect you. And Ichigo's connection to protection would reach its peak when the Arankara arc ended, leading to the final battle with Aizen. As we mentioned at the beginning of this video, Ichigo's idea of protection wasn't the same as the old man's, the Quincy power within him. Then Sazangitsu explained to Ichigo that he didn't care about what Ichigo wanted to protect. Thus, there was always this conflict between the old man's desire to protect Ichigo from dangers and Ichigo's desire to protect others from those dangers. But in the end, as we saw Ichigo's desire won, he sacrificed all his hard-earned Shinigami powers to defeat Aizen. And here we reach a new turning point in Ichigo's story about protection. This happened in the Fullbring arc. The mental pressure Ichigo faced in this arc was unlike anything he had experienced before. Ichigo was exposed to various shocks that lead him to a desire to kill. And Ichigo was trying to convince himself that losing his Shinigami powers was good because he wanted to stop seeing souls and ghosts etc. And this was just to hide his feelings of weakness without his powers. You can't protect those you care about with words alone. You need power. That's why Kubo took away Ichigo's power and put him in a situation where those he wanted to protect were in danger. And this began with Ginju, who planted doubts in Ichigo's mind about his father and Urahara. We saw Ichigo say, if I had my Shinigami powers, I would have sensed him. And he was speaking about Ishin. And things got worse when Ichida was attacked by Ginju. And this event alone made Ichigo feel lost because he couldn't protect those he cares about them. And eventually this led him to join Ichigo's group even though he didn't trust him from the start. But he had no other choice. Then Kobo made things even worse for Ichigo. When Ichigo finally got forebring powers and wanted to protect his friends from Tsukujima, he found them standing against him. So, what was Ichigo supposed to do to protect if his friends and family were on the opposite side? What was the point of the power he worked so hard to gain? This scene where Ichigo describes his feelings is one of my favorites because it shows the depth of his mental state. Ichigo reached his lowest point when Ginjo stole his powers. That was the final blow he couldn't withstand, and he started crying. Ichigo's tears weren't just because of what Ginju did, but because of the events that led him to that point. Power was Ichigo's weapon to protect others, and now it was taken from him. That's why Ichigo's goal of protection is not simple, but involves many developments related to the story. So when Ichigo's power returned, it had a special meaning. This power didn't come easily, but with great difficulty, especially mentally. The upcoming events raise the protection theme to another level, which I can describe as the final level. We saw how the Shinigami's view of Ichigo changed. Ichigo, who was once considered just a Ryuka and someone to fight, was now seen as a hero, a saver. After the Shinigami's crushing defeat and what happened to them in the first invasion, their feelings about this grow stronger, and Ichigo also felt this responsibility. And Ichigo expressed this clearly in this scene as did Byakuya when he asked Ichigo to protect the Soul Society. 
what Ichigo achieved in previous arcs and overcoming difficulties in developing his powers ended with Zangitsu accepting Ichigo's desire to protect and lead to release all of his spiritual power that was suppressed by the Osa. This enabled Ichigo to reach a level where he could defend not just his family and his friends but the entire world. But the question arises, is Ichigo capable of protecting the world by sacrificing himself again? The answer is yes. This is what Ichigo was planning as a backup plan in case of Ryu's death, making Ichigo the center of the soul society. However, I wonder if Ichigo will think before making this decision. Will he be okay with being in a place many consider the soul society sin? I don't know. Perhaps the memories Ichigo saw during Ichigo's training were like giving Ichigo a choice to see for himself what happened in the past and then decide whether he would take Ryu's place or not. In the end guys, as you can see the protection theme in the story of Bleach is not that simple. Ichigo doesn't have a big goal but has a complex path and complex character ab about the theme of protection. So what do you think guys about Ichigo? In his goal, tell me your opinions in the comments and see you guys in my next video.